Here we are, Betty. Um, and yeah, over to you, Francois. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jeremy, and thanks. And I've started to realize that this really is the most stressful lecture of the year for me because, firstly, I've got to come up with something entertaining and useful for this crowd, and particularly for Jeremy, because he like sits and like in judgments of all the like stuff I and I've got to come up with something that he doesn't know, which is next to impossible. Um, it's particularly hard this year because he chaired the conference. So like all the talks where I would have actually had something interesting to say, he's already had to sit through. Um, but the second thing that's really particular is I haven't had much chance to prepare for this because we've got a hyperactive dean with an interest in infectious diseases and particularly in respiratory diseases. And since there's one that seems to be circulating at the moment, he's kept Jeremy and me really, really busy over the last few weeks um, being immersed in all of this. I think next time we choose a, gene, a dean, we need to like get a sports scientist or an orthopod or somebody um, to sort of take, distract us from all of this. So this has been quite a stressful lecture to prepare for. And um, so what I thought I'd do is actually take two lectures. I I, um, I, I've done this in the, in the recent past and look at two areas that I think might interest you. Um, one is looking at the new drugs that are barreling towards us and one drug in particular that I think is interesting and I did give this lecture at the HIV conference. So those of you who had to sit through this, I'm sorry. Um, it's one of the long acting drugs that I think is particularly exciting and I've been spent my morning talking to other drug companies about the manufacturing of it. Um, and yeah, I hope even those of you who've heard of it can start just thinking about how we could use this drug and some of the things that are puzzling for clinicians in particular in terms of how we're going to use this. And then the, the self-created problem of weight gain in HIV positive patients and some of the, the, the things I've been thinking about this year about how we're going to solve this. And um, yeah, and just not the all the advanced drama, I'll touch on that, but just some of the, what we're gonna have to do as clinicians in dealing with weight gain and um, some of the stuff that applies to us uh, who are dealing with middle age spread anyway. So let's get going. And just to thank um, Samiso for her slides, I didn't even tell her I was using them, but I stole them and um, I'll use them. And these are just my various um, evil disclosures. So again, those of you who are interested, HIV Pipeline puts out this um, annual report and they do amazing work. In fact, it's really fascinating. They, um, all the people around the world um, rely on the activists to put together this uh, sort of update on all the latest um, drugs and diagnostics, not just for HIV, but for TB and hepatitis C. Um, and those of you who are interested in you know, what's on, what's coming along, just, just go and pull this PDF off, of, um, off their website. It's really, really useful. So the long actings are the next big leap forward. Um, and part of the reason for this is that oral, um, tenofovir, lamivudine, dolotegavir, TAF, um, uh, lamivudine, um, emtricitabine, bictegavir, all the various combinations daily is actually really hard to beat. It, um, so in the rich countries, they're using TAF, Bictegravir combinations um, with whatever cytosine analog is available. Usually it's emtricitabine in the USA. Um, increasingly in Europe, that's what they're using. In like, countries like ours, it's TLD. And honestly, there's extremely little to choose between those two. And, and it's increasingly what the world is, is moving towards en masse. There are other variations, deravarine-based regimens. There's occasional patients still on the back of there, even occasional patients on nevirapine here and there. But really, this combination of a tenofovir or TAF-based regimen in, with a second-generation integrase inhibitor is the way the world's going. And the reason for that is, is that they are really amazing. And when you compare it to anything in the past, you know, the the resistance barrier is near unbreakable. We still are battling to find people who are breaking it in first line. Even in second and third line, you know, you really have to try pretty hard to get past it. And on a public health level, you know, we're not even seeing a need for second and even, you know, for second line um, guidelines to deal with, with these patients. Um, it is phenomenally well tolerated. And one of my hobbies now is to ask, you know, people looking after neurotic Europeans and Americans and saying, like, when do you have to switch patients on Big Tegravir or if they're on Dolly Tegravir? Like, have you ever had to? And I say, yeah, once upon a time, there was this one patient who had some insomnia. And I think we switched because we thought maybe the insomnia was this and that. And once upon a time, there was somebody with some weight gain, and we thought, well, we're trying, and really is that level of, of, of switch that they were doing. 
Um, and many patients end up on a drug like Derevarine because they thought they'd like to put the patient on that first for just, you know, to make it less boring in the HIV clinic. So this really is the level at which we're dealing with this stuff. Something um, they have to deal with a little less than us is the issue of the drug-drug interactions. But with the Favarins, it was an unrecognized um, problem was the, the, the interactions with um, hormonal contraception and lots and lots of breakthrough pregnancies on efavirenz based regimens. And it's not a problem we have with the second generation integrase inhibitors. The other thing is it's sitting at around $60 a year um, at the moment in South Africa and most places in the world um, who have the generics and there are lots and lots of generics available. So that's dirt cheap. You must remember that the efavirenz based regimen um, when we switched across was about $100 a year. And a couple of years ago, we were paying $150 a year for, um, for our favorite space regimen. So this stuff has come down to, to levels where it's actually quite hard to make it a whole lot cheaper. So for instance, going to TAF might wipe out about 10% from the cost, but there's, you know, driving down the cost is getting harder and harder for people like me who deal with that kind of, that kind of research. And what's the funny thing is that's a kind of philosophical thing for me to think about. Like I've had, many of you have had to deal with this as well, but like I've had to deal with all these drugs over the years. Is we're seeing the slow extinction of all these drugs like efavirenz. I don't think we have efavirenz around in five years time, but even the PIs are slowly like becoming less and less, probably gonna have a few of them on patients on them who like have been around for a while. But I'll take over here, I can't see any real role for it outside of pediatrics. AZT, you know, with these two, studies artist and, um, and Nadia slowly like is going to become extinct. Um, and even TAF and Sinofovir, there's a debate with the rise of the dual therapies, whether we'll have these drugs for anything other than for hepatitis B. So, you know, like, like antiretroviral therapy is becoming really, really boring actually, because, you know, you've got these incredibly well tolerated drugs. So you've got these long actings, which are now coming along and, you know, there's this whole, um, industry that's going into this, not just for antiretrovirals, but for a whole range of other drugs, just looking at patches and implants and all sorts of things that are um, micro needles and things that, um, that are really exciting. Now we've had in antiretroviral land, um, drugs for prevention and treatment, they've had a long history and the history kind of like ran into a wall for a while. You know, we had these horror shows, um, Zardovudine certainly, and Alluvia um, um, for PrEP and PEP, but they, they were so badly tolerated that they kind of, we used them for treatment and for prevention, but they were really badly tolerated for 10 or 20 years. We used them, but you know, we weren't going to really pursue them beyond that. But as soon as like Tenofovir came along um, and then TAF in combination with, um, with 3TC and FTC, um, this, this has started to explode in the last few years with drugs like habitegravir, lenacapavir, islatravir, I'm going to talk a lot about those in a moment, um, has meant that this kind of like expansion of these drugs across treatments and prevention has started to happen. I'm going to talk about this drug islatravir, and it's um, an interesting one. Um, we started to test it in central Johannesburg in a couple of clinical trials for Merck, who's the manufacturer at the moment. And I'm gonna talk about it just simply because there's some interesting facts about it. Um, and it's more interesting than the average drug. Um, so it's called a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. And I still have to practice this in front of the mirror. Um, and it's a little bit like the way I feel about, you know, TAF and the fact that it has a special name um, assigned to it. And in some ways, I think it's a little bit overkill and might well actually fall away. Um, I didn't know it was derived from soy sauce flavoring and it's something I suspect Merck has suppressed. It's marketing people and you'll see that there are lots of things about this drug that Merck probably wants to suppress. Merck moves very, very slowly when it comes to drugs. It took forever to, to bring Raltegravir forward. Um, you know, when you compare it to a machine that is Gilead um, and Vive, who, who are not quite as good as Gilead, but they're pretty fast. But Merck really, I think it's mainly because they make all their money from cardiovascular drugs and oncology drugs, just plods when it comes to ARVs relative to these other, these other manufacturers. But it's kind of started developing this drug in 2012. It's gone through as all, Guy, Guy Richards always shouts at me about ARVs and the fact that it's got about each drug's got about 19 names, um, but it's now abbreviated as ISL. So just keep your name, your eye on that. But you'll often see the people who work in this field calling it um, EFDA. And previously it was MK8591, which even I can't even remember. What's interesting about this drug, um, 
is it's one of the it's the first drug in the in, of not just in HIV but in the field which is made through pure enzyme synthesis. And if you really want to watch biochemists get all nerdy and um, and it's quite sweet to watch the, the literature because there's all these like really passionate blogs and like sort of like breathless like discussions about this drug um, like this quote I just loved it when I was looking at it but essentially um, when you do normal drug manufacture one of my formative moments was going down to Port Elizabeth to, uh, to go back and to go and watch um, um, Aspen's factory and essentially in Asp Aspen's got this massive um, looks actually a bit like the gen like this big concrete block and these trucks sort of drive to the top and they sort of dump chemicals into these essentially these funnels which then go through a series of washing machines from level to level which get mixed up and um, sort of um, the various chemicals get mixed and at the bottom they sort of spit out capsules or tablets and they get mixed into their little foil packets and and get dumped into their their little pots and things like that and it's it's quite something to see that um the you know how drugs get made um but at each step there are there's waste as you can imagine as um what happens with Islatravir though is it goes through a chemical process and there's absolutely no waste you kind of like pour the chemicals in the one side and well not quite the tablet but the pure um, synthetic chemical comes out the other um, and this this um, this process called biocatalysis um, is apparently completely novel. Merck put a huge amount of money into this process and as I said it's the first drug that's been manufactured this way. Um, now the reason this is important to us is that firstly apparently you can get huge volumes of a drug with no waste and um, as I said it's this, this revolution in drug manufacture. So one of the reasons I was meeting with Aspen guys this morning was to say like how hard is this technology to get across, you know? Now, normally tech transfers, you'll see lots of drama around mRNA and vaccines and stuff in the COVID field that then people saying there needs to be tech transfers. Um, when I talk to the drug manufacturers, they say actually the tech transfers aren't that important for drug manufacturers because particularly generics are actually really good at this. They say that, uh, you know, that they, when it comes to manufacturing of drugs, they're actually much better than the, the originators at making this because they much better at, at, at leveraging efficiencies than, um, than many of these, these drug companies because drug, you know, the originators just don't have to be efficient to make a profit. They just need to sell lots and lots of, they just need to sell their drugs in rich countries. While generics have to sell stuff at, uh, with, at low margins. So, you know, but I had never realized this until I started talking to them when they said like, yeah, you know, they'll give us the tech transfer. It'll make things a bit bigger, better, but we'll reverse engineer the stuff anyway. And we'll probably have to fix the, the, um, the process anyway. This may not operate when it comes to these enzymatic um, processes. And they may need to actually make this, find out how to do this because the, the process is already super efficient. Now, this term, what they said is they created an unnatural nucleoside. And I can again see the, the Merck um, sort of marketing people like going pale when they see this. You know, if you look at Molinopiravir and the fact that it's called a mutagenic nu nucleoside, you can imagine again the same Merck marketers are going to have to do a big job there to try and like sort that one out. Um, but this this process of synthesis actually made its way into science. You can see the pro the, the article up there on the right. Um, was actually published in science, just the very process of the manufacture of the molecule. It's such a significant step forward. And again, you can see the sort of breathlessness in the in the, the quote at the bottom at the bottom uh, over there. Um, so again, just from a general drugs manufacturing process, this is a huge step forward. This drug, um, I, I didn't. I, I mean, this all passed me by. You know, I tend to stick around until the drugs actually get a name. Um, and finally, this one does have this name, as I said, is Latravir, and there's a lot of excitement about this drug. So as I said, it's called nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Now, some of this might be a bit of drug, voodoo, uh, drug company voodoo, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, it has incredibly high affinity for the reverse transcriptase enzyme, much more so than um, other current NRTIs. And I'll show you just some of the graphs attached to that. So that kind of binding mechanism of tenofovir and AZT and all the others, is latrovir just seems to bind that much more tightly. And it does what the other nukes do, which is um, prevent elongation of the DNA primer and it creates that chain break that we all had to learn when we were writing the exams. 
what does if the elongation does occur if it manages to get past that process it then causes the delayed chain termination when i asked Merck, like how often does it actually get past if it binds so tightly like you know does it ever get past and they sort of fudged the answer a little bit but um i'm i, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk to the to the person who actually designed the uh, who actually like would be able to answer that question directly but it would be an interesting thing to ask is like you know uh, this is great that binds so tightly is this actually a real thing that needs to cause this delayed chain termination or is this just interesting theoretically but this drug is really an overachiever because even once it's done its dirty work it goes backwards it synthesizes back into the plasma and then gets um gets back and then goes and does and enters an, a new cell and then starts working again so it's really is quite a remarkable drug. I'm not sure it needs to do all these, uh, these second and third step because the first step looks like it does a pretty, pretty good job. So why are we excited? Well, the first thing is it's incredibly potent. Um, it causes this incredible rapid viral decay. Now we see this with the integrase inhibitors. Previously, we saw this with the, the, NR, the NNRTIs, we saw it with the favorins. Before that, we saw it with the protease inhibitors. So we're kind of getting a bit used to this. We expect it from all our drugs that you know the viral decay goes down fast. Uh, so maybe, so what? In the context of PMTCT, you know, you want the viral decay to be fast, but that's in a very, very small group of people now in this day and age. So, you know, most of us involved in clinical HIV like kind of shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, well. We expected that it's got a very long half-life and i'm going to get that back to you about that in just a moment in fact the longest half-life we've had with antiretrovirals it's also got an incredible resistance barrier that binding process means that um you know that you, we have to try hard and we can't seem to get past you know there is a, some sort of loss of potency but none that's actually meaningful and again from we kind of getting used to this. We're getting spoiled in HIV land where, you know, like now we've had the integrase inhibitors for a while. We're like, yeah, well, so what? This is the starting point is the, the thou shalt see no resistance. So, you know, the, the developers of his latter are like, please appreciate us. And we're like, yeah, whatever. It's like get on with the next thing to, to excite us. And, you know, so this is the stuff that is quite freaky though, is, the daily dose is 0.7 mill five milligrams. The weekly dose that you need is 10 milligrams and the monthly dose is 60 milligrams. Now remember that dolutegravir daily dose is 50 milligrams. 0.75 milligrams is pretty much a sprinkle on a cupcake, I, I imagine. Um, and this is why we can put it in an implantable, annual implantable for, for prophylaxis is these unbelievably low doses. Now these very low doses mean very small tablets, almost no packaging. Um, it means you can do an implantable and it means very, very low cost of production. So all these things are very, very good things for a low middle income country. There are known inter drug interactions with hormonal contraception. So again, good news for us. And the immediate, um, so it's early days yet, it's only been tested in a few hundred, maybe a thousand patients, are uh, that the side effects are very, very mild. The kind of stuff, you know, again, that was reported in the early days of the integrase inhibitor development, which is mild headache, diarrhea. You know, we, we have to use it properly before we can sign off on this. Um, but at the moment, it's all looking good. There's a bit of a wobble last week, very weird wobble, where there's lots of drama and urgent phone calls and, you know, and emails and stock dropped slightly, which is always a worry. Um, but the CD4 count, um, in one of the studies, in the high dose studies of, elat is, uh, of Islatrivia, when it was combined with NRTI, um, dropped. Now, there's no clinical consequence to that. And again, clinicians are like, whatever, you know, like as long as the patient's fine, like C4 count drops, we're not that excited by that. So it's not quite clear why that happened. Um, and there's lots of you know, excitement and stuff about that. So we'll see how that plan plays out and whether that actually is clinically relevant or if it's just you know, part of a lymphopenia or whatever, we'll see. You know, there's just abnormal hematological results. What that translates into, let's see how that pans out. I, I find it difficult to get excited about isolated lab results, but I'm sure the competitors are all watching it with an eagle eye. So this just shows you all the, like the stuff that they've been doing to, to look at the, the half-life um, of, the, of the various formulations. 
on the left, you can see that they were playing with the various formulations and the various um, the various doses of, of the drug. And on the right, you can see the, the comparisons in terms of the inhibitory quotients they were playing with, with the doses versus um, the other the other nukes that we're comparing it there, you can see tetanofovir and the cytosine analogs. So yeah, this is all that the Jay Hrobler, it's not a South African, um, who was in, heavily involved in the development of, of the drug. So what's the trajectory been of the drug? As I said, Merck is not as fast as Gilead. I think Gilead would have had this drug in all, all our patients' mouths by now. Um, the first development reports started to come around since 2016. They're now firmly into phase two and three. Um, part of the problem they've had is finding a partner drug. The stuff works very long. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to find a daily partner drug, but when you've got weekly partner drugs, a monthly and six monthly and annual partner drugs, those just haven't really been around. So now they've had to go and speak to mortal enemies like Gilead and, um, and talk about an exciting drug Gilead has, which is um, Lena Kapavir, which I'll just talk about very briefly. So they've barreled into, for Merck at any rate, um, into phase twos and threes. And then they, um, so the first thing they did is they went into, they took Deraverine, which is the N in the RTI, very nice N in the RTI, and like, you know, got a better side effect profile. Um, it's kind of a step up from Rolpivirine, um, a little bit better resistance profile, it's 100 milligrams, still causes a little bit of a rash, a little bit of a um, um, liver issue, but still very, very, very well tolerated, much better than infavirates. Um, and combined with 3TC and his Latravir. And then they compared it to Deraverine with his Latravir. And some, for some bizarre reason, I still can't get my head around, they dropped the 3TC arm because they kept getting viral blips. I, for the life of me, cannot make, um, I can't understand it. So they've taken forward just the Deraverine is Latravir arm, and we're busy evaluating that in Hillbrow, uh, in, in our site in Hillbrow in, um, in Parktown. So anyway, so that's happily going forward in the phase three. I just love this term on the, the development thing is the dose of is Latravir is so small that they had to, quote, lightly spray it on the Deraverine tablet to get the 0.25 milligrams on the 100 milligram tablet. So that's going through into phase three. And I think that's the one they're going up head to head with um, Bictegravir, with Bictavi. So that's their hopeful one. They're going to try and take on the Gilead um, mon um, monster in um, in, in rich countries. They, they've got an NNRTI called MK8507, a weekly one, um, which they're combining with this Latravir. Um, it's very, very similar to Deravering, but you can dose it weekly. And again, you can use it in hormonal contraception. It doesn't seem to have many drug-drug interactions. And that one is also making its way through the phase two, phase three things. And at that point, I would keep an eye on it. It's a very interesting combination. Um, so weekly compared to daily, you can imagine all the, the issues around adherence and all the rest of the stuff that we're going to need to do. And again, there's a whole pediatric, adolescent, patient, naive patients, experienced patients, development program that's going in that. Um, yeah, all those things um, with all these drugs. So this is a fairly conventional HIV, for those who are not involved, it's a fairly conventional um, path for, for, for patients uh, for, for developing these drugs. We did put to, um, I was in Mexico two years ago, we had a, the first time I'd ever heard of his Latravir, to be quite honest. Like I said, I only really pay attention when they start naming the drugs. Um, they, they presented this data in a closed ad board and, um, and I was there with all the, the HIV glitterati and they were all saying, why don't you try this monotherapy for treatment? Now, monotherapy in HIV treatment studies is like kind of anathema to, you know, the, it failed with um, PIs, it failed with, you know, we went through the 90s with nukes and everything, it failed at every single point, and most recently failed with the integrase inhibitors, with dolutegravir. But is Latravia looks frickens to play with so because I put it um, to them. So I see my internet connection drop for a moment there. So you might get this very speed up. But um, yeah, we were quite keen to try this in like 20 highly characterized patients and there was no way. Um, so 
Um, this was just one of the studies we were, we were going to put them. They vary, they're taking, including in South Africa, they're going to be testing it as pre exposure prophylaxis. So, you know, this is um, so, firstly, as a 60 milligram monthly dose. So, you know, one of the problems with pre exposure prophylaxis has been adherence. So, instead of taking it daily, as you know, the usual prep um, is usually to not forget 3DC, um, 60 milligrams once a month. Um, is hopefully going to be much better and things like directly observed therapies and things like that become much more practical than you know daily um, sort of approaches. Merck is our contraceptive giants and obviously they, they do all the implantable stuff like Implanon um, so they've immediately been able to repurpose Islatravir and be able to think about putting in as an implant so they've been starting to do the development of it. There's also some of you might know there's Depivirin and NRTI they've uh, kind of weak, um, um, well, uh, sort of like very modest prevention um, impacts, but they, they're hopefully, um, they're going to be using it as, uh, as with, uh, with his Latravir and testing that as a, as a ring and hopefully it'll, it'll be more potent than depivering. Um, so the potential though is, yeah, is a monthly or even as a weekly treatment. The monthly, the problem is a pairing drug, but even as a weekly drug, something I didn't really appreciate, I suddenly realized you know, you give patients TLD, they get 28 tablets a month, you know, and you give them three months and if they're lucky, they can get six months. Here, you might give patients 24 tablets for six months. That's a, just a blister pack. You know, that's quite something. And if they get the monthly treatment option, you can give them six tablets for six months, 12 tablets if they take it for a year. That's quite, quite something. It's a complete departure from my, my certainly my classic thinking around adherence. Um, for PrEP, they've got the monthly option. There's the annual option if they get the implant on. Um, if generic licensing happens, you know, the, we might get that $60 right, right down, you know, in a fairly major way. Even if with the, the implantable, it's looking pretty, um, pretty good. So that's is Latravia in a, in a summary. It's really quite remarkable what the drug might do. Now, obviously, we just need one major side effect. You know, we just need their livers to explode or their brains to turn around or something, and then you know, it's game over. But these, these long actings is where the game's going. And I cannot really see much improvement on TLD unless some new side effect jumps out. But we've had tens of millions of patients on TLD now without anything dramatic happening. So yeah, you know, with every passing week, I think we gain confidence that the TLD combination is actually really robust and really safe. So, you know, and I'll talk about the weight stuff in just a moment, but pretty, pretty hard to, to, to beat. Then a the Capavir is Gilead's offering. Um, it's a capsid inhibitor. And as I said, it's been developed lightning fast because Gilead is a machine. Um, it's, it's got this alliance with Merck because it's, Gilead's got other drugs to pair it with, but they're not nearly as potent as Latravir. So I think they're really keen to see it going forward. It's also being used as for treatment and for PrEP. Um, there are studies looking at it for both. Um, and what's interesting about Linacapavir is it's being used subcutaneously. And this is important because if it can be given subcutaneously, the patients can self-administer it. Um, as opposed to some of the drugs I'm going to talk to you about in a moment where it's impossible for the patients to self-administer. So this, again, introduces something that's quite weird. is like the idea of a patient giving themselves a six-monthly injection is an interesting idea. And I'm not sure if it's good or it's bad. You know, again, for us in the HIV field, these are new concepts. Um, in fact, I imagine that there's nothing really that, that, that would be like that. And again... It's brilliantly tolerated in the limited number of patients it's being used in. And again, the kind of resistance barrier that we're all expecting. With one caveat, I'll get to the main Linux. I'm just going to rush through these. These are some research trial uh, slides, by the way, I, I just stole. The major study that there was is a dose finding study was the Calibrate study, um, where they looked at oral linocapavir and injectable linocapavir. They went up with Gilead's bespoke drugs, which are TAF and m um, and against Bictegravir which is obviously Gilead's offering. Um, they were heavily, I love this, this but Lena Kapavir, Gilead were heavily congratulated for allowing pregnant women to go onto their study. Now, that was amazing. And congratulations to Gilead, except for the fact that one of the study of arms did not have a single woman in it. And you can see why, because only 7% of the people they recruited were women. So I, 
you know, I, I, there's a lot of political pressure on the drug companies to recruit more women into their studies. And this was not one of the studies that did particularly well. So they did make more, far more progress in terms of recruiting black people, which I think is they do need credit for. Um, but certainly um, they do need to make more effort in terms of, uh, of, of recruiting women. And the people did very, very well. Um, and as you'd expect in these studies that, um, and they have one patient that did not suppress and this patient developed a mutation. So there is a little bit of a concern here. Um, you know, the, we are gonna to need to play with this drug a little bit more before we can sign off on it. This is very early days. Um, the Capella um, study, which looked at subcutaneous um, um, Elena Capavir and is moving through phase two and phase three. And this is sort of a stress test. And they looked at patients with lots and lots of mutations. These are highly treatment patients. And they managed to get virological suppression in 81% of patients. So again, fairly conventional way of taking this stuff through. This is so that we're still in relatively early days of Elena Capavir um, developments. Um, we'll see how it pans out. It's looking fairly promising. The fact that it's subcutaneous, you can use it six monthly is pretty, pretty amazing. So it's all very promising in the Lena Capavir front and we'll see how it pans out. Um, as I said, the, there are a couple of other drugs in earlier development by all the drug companies. I know which way this is going. It's, it's going to be long acting. I'm not going to, I talked about k and, and Rilpivirine, um, the other injectables, these are all given two monthly at the moment, one monthly or two monthly, and they're on their way to South Africa quite soon. They'll probably be here in the next year or two. Um, these are all the major trials that, that are there. I'm not going to bore you with the details. Um, I want to talk more about the, the problems associated with these. So these drugs are given as treatment. Um, Cabotegravir is being explored as prophylaxis. In fact, so is Rolpivirine now. Um, and Cabotegravir's prophylaxis is looking very, very good. And in fact, probably is going to be with us first before any of the treatment drugs. Um, but Cabotegravir Rolpivirine has to be given as two individual injections. Um, Rolpivirine requires a cold chain. They're both fairly painful injections, apparently. Um, and these are the various studies to demonstrate head to head um, that they need to be given. The, um, one good thing is there's, there used to be a lead in dose and there's a study that's just come from a couple of weeks ago from Lance HIV demonstrating that that's, that's no, um, that's no longer necessary. By the way, the only reason I have this photograph here is this is a South African import, Chloe Orkin. Um, her hair is now purple, so you may not recognize her anymore. Um, that she, um, she's like, a, she's like the long acting injectable and long acting person involved in studies all over the, the place. She's now based in London but she is a proud South African export and she is dying to always in interact with South Africans. So if you ever get a chance, go and visit her. So we don't need the, the lead in oral doses. Like we used to have, we used to have this ghastly thing with nevirapine where you had to like dose escalated after two weeks, which is very, very difficult. So now you can go straight to the injections. Um, patients love it. They just love these injections for reasons which are not entirely clear to me, but they do. Um, and we'll see whether this uh, is the case in South Africa, but initial, initially they've been used quite a lot in the clinical trials in South Africa. The patients seem to really enjoy them. Let's just keep an eye on the time. Sorry, just seeing. Oh, no. But it's a bit of a palaver. You have to have a whole thing where you have to inject it different places. I used to, like I told them, well, it isn't just like the EpiPen. Why can't the patients just give it to themselves? But you have to do it in a certain place. There's a whole mapping exercise. You can see this stuff from the, from the, um, um, from the from the package insert, um, so it's uh, it's not as if you you actually need a healthcare practitioner to actually give you the injection. So if the patients have to come back every two months, as opposed to pick up their tablets every three months, maybe patients won't be that thrilled because they have to come to the healthcare provider every th three times every six months rather than twice. You know those benefits maybe may not as apparent to the patients after a little while. So there's a big debate about these huge benefits that the long acting is given. This particular class of drugs might not be as useful. There's some potential that they might be dosed three monthly, and then you've got these ones which might be dosed six monthly. So yeah, there's some fiddly stuff that we need to get right um, with these, these new injectables and long actings. So we, a lot of us are like, oh God, yeah, we have to do this again. We have to go look at the drug-drug interactions. We have to look at TB. We have to do pregnancy stuff. We have to like worry about teratogenicity and PMCT and all the other nonsense that's, you know, before we start moving it into guidelines. Um, 
And like, what about the weekly tablet? Like, will our patients remember? You know, like, there's a big debate about this. Like, and the interesting thing is like, you know, in the antidepressant world and in the contraception world, people have had to deal with these kind of like adherence complexity around not dosing every day um, for a long time. So there's, you know, maybe we just need to go and sit the psychiatrists and the contraceptive people down and maybe have these conversations and learn this from them. Um, because a lot of the patients are saying, hell yes, we want this. And, you know, initially when people said to me a weekly tablet, I was like, no, patients will never remember. But honestly, like um, if the huge price reductions, which they look like they would be, and it's not totally clear that patients wouldn't be less adherent, maybe we should start thinking a bit harder about how we're going to get weekly, potentially even monthly adherence going forward. So, yeah, that's a challenge to all of us involved in clinical medicine is we have to step outside our little comfort zones for a while. But TLD is pretty damn amazing. So like we really got to ask ourselves, is it worth it? But I'm afraid I increasingly think the answer is yes, it's worth it. Even if it's feeling it's painful, the thought of it. We have to get used to, I, I'm afraid this is something the hepatitis B people are fighting tooth and nail about is the price of going to two drug, dual drug therapy is the loss of hepatitis B cover. And we just have to think creatively about screening. Um, they keep saying, oh, we can't lose enough of here. We cannot go to dual drug therapy. We can't go to long actings. It reminds me too much of the people who said, you can't, um, you know, you can't go to integrase inhibitors. You can't lose efavirenz because um, we need to be able to use these new TB prevention regimens. You know, it's just tough luck. You know, we cannot, like for 7% of patients with hepatitis B, punish the other 93%. We just have to find more creative ways to sort out hep B. And for those of you interested in this field, no one has stepped forward yet to think about this. And I really think there's a whole career waiting for people to start thinking about the operational side of, of screening for hepatitis B. We need to think about the cost reduction about these long actings, whether the injectables, all the orals, there's again, a whole lot of stuff that needs to be done here. And the hero people here at FITS are doing amazing work already on cost reductions and modeling this stuff. Um, and Andrew Phillips in, in London as well, done wonderful work on this stuff. Again, lots of work to be done for people actually interested in the area. So just finishing up on the long acting stuff and the new drugs before I do the weight stuff. I think it probably is the future. I think Islatrophy is only one of many drugs, but the one I certainly like, know the most about, I guess that's obviously. And, um, Gilead wouldn't slip me anywhere near Lenocapavir after the stuff we did to them around TAF. They still haven't forgiven us for the TAF makes you gain weight stuff, which unfortunately I think is not true anymore. Um, so I can't talk to you with as much depth, but um, I think that's also an interesting drug to keep an eye on. So there's lots of potential with these drugs. They're more convenient. There's less cost associated with the manufacturing and with the non sexy stuff like packaging. Um, but there's lots of work to be done. And I must say, I feel quite weary looking at it from here um, in terms of all the usual stuff we have to get past to just to get it to guidelines. I'm sure poor people like Jeremy, you have to do the guidelines stuff. I'm um, looking at all the debates we're gonna have to have around that. And people like me have to do the very dull stuff around licensing and talking to generic companies and trying to convince them. Um, that stuff, yeah, is, is lots and lots of work. Um, and then the adherence stuff is interesting. I think for all of us, a bit of a challenge, getting ourselves um, thinking about how to, we're going to have to do it. But it's exciting stuff, and I think it's good. I must say, antiretroviral therapy, TLD has made my life very, very boring. This stuff has at least made me feel a little bit more excited about getting out of bed in the morning, um, not thinking about COVID. So, yeah, so now in this part of the discussion here, yeah, and then move quickly into the getting fat um, um, part of the, the thing. And this is a shorter part of it, but. Um, yeah, just talking about getting fat in an ARV clinic and uh, and the, like not being able to do anything about it. And like and this for me is like I wrote a grant, which Jeremy knows. I've I've cried on his shoulder repeatedly about the fact that it didn't get funded because I think it was the best grant ever written in the history of grant writing. And um, unfortunately, it didn't get funded by the horrible NIH, despite the fact, as I said, it was the best grant. But this is why we wrote this grant is. This is one of the patients, um, I see this thunder and lightning coming at the moment. So I'll try and motor through this so none of us get electrocuted. We had this patient who came to our clinic, 35 year old advanced patient. She was on the TAF arm of advanced, Dolitegvi obviously. She walked through with a baseline BMI of 23, which was actually lower than the average woman who came into our study, which is about 26. Um, 
so she shot up her BMI, shot up to 44, which by the way, was not un that unusual actually on the study. And she did all the stuff. We got the dietitian involved, she exercised, she did all the good stuff. Um, and she told us she was doing all this stuff. We switched her in those days. We thought this was a good idea because we thought, you know, if Averins wasn't causing weight, we thought the TAF was making her fat and the dollar taker was making her fat. Um, but she continued to gain weight. So we f switched her across to the first arm, but she just went on and on. And she just dissolved into clear tears and she was completely helpless in our clinic. She said, I'm doing everything right. And yet I'm continuing to gain weight. Like I just can't do anything else. Like you, I'm spending a fortune on the food you get, you tell me to do this. I'm trying to exercise, but nothing is okay. And it's, it's horrible. I mean, you know what you do when you're faced by a patient like this, they're doing everything. They plead with you to give them something else. And we had nothing to offer her. Now there's another patient who came in. This was much, in some ways, much funnier. Um, not funny, funny. 35 year old woman as well. She, her BMI is 35. So she's not 44, but she's certainly large. And she's completely fine with her weight. It's been 35 for a couple of years or so, sitting around. She's on her ARVs. All her metabolics are absolutely fine. Her blood pressure is fine, lipids, glucose. Every now and year or so, she gets them checked out and she's absolutely fine. She's active. She's vegetarian. She's in a good marriage. She's got good kids. So she's fine. And she's like pissed off because every time she walks through the door, it doesn't matter whether she's a pap smear or she's dropped a brick on her toe, the first thing the doctor wants to talk to her about is her weight. And she's like absolutely annoyed about this. Like she doesn't want to talk about her weight. She's fine with her weight. But this, she says, she says, she knows, she's actually quite familiar with medical data. She's like, I'm healthier than most of the people who are trying to intervene with me, like get lost. And like, it's actually really annoys her, like these, this continual. So where have, in HIV land, what's, what's with this weight gain signal in HIV? Now, the first thing is that we now know that efavirenz makes people either lose weight or it mitigates weight gain in the slow metabolites. A significant percentage of black patients and some white patients, but a significant black patient population metabolize efavirenz slowly and that causes a form of lipoatrophy. And the, it's not a good thing. It's also associated with your liver exploding. It's associated with all the bad metabolic. It pushes your lipids up. It pushes your glucose up. So it makes your bones uh, dissolve. It's all just bad, bad, bad. So switching to efavirenz to make you lose weight is not a good option. So why we missed it all those years is not entirely apparent. The Kryptonians described it actually really well. So that is a bad thing. So if your patient's gaining weight on dolotegravir, switching to the favorins is now fallen away as an option. Unfortunately, we don't know what you can switch to. We have no data. We've got a little bit of promising data on deraverine, but even that's a little bit iffy. Um, but you can't switch to real proverine. Being on real proverine also makes you gain weight. You can't switch to PI. We know that can make you gain weight. We have no options at the moment. Um, most of us actually believe that switching to bictegravir or or a dollar ticker year, or being on them from the point go is actually weight neutral. That what you gain there is what you're destined to gain. We know that being on tenofovir is mitigates weight gain, but that that weight gain is it's a very modest mitigation. So it either makes you gain lose a tiny bit of weight, or it modestly mitigates their weight gain, usually by about 0.5 um, kilograms a year. So it's not nothing to write home about. This is not a weight loss drug. We're not 100% sure about TAF. Um, some people still think it makes you gain weight. I think most of the fraternity thinks it's also weight neutral. Right? Once you're on TAF, dolotegravir or TAF, big tegravir, you, you're going to gain the weight God intended you to weight gain. So that's pretty much it. And the risk factors are the ones you know. If you start with a low CD4 count and viral load, that's what you're going to get. And the worst part of it is it's amongst black women. And unfortunately for us, that's who we treat. We treat black women who started with a low CD4 count and a high viral load. The worst part of it is that if you started your antiretrovirals with a low CD4 count and a high viral load 10 years ago, you're still going to gain weight now if you switch today. And this is the problem is that the switch patients, when we switched across to TLD in the last two years, they're still going to gain weight. There's no protective factor from being on them in the last 10 years. And that's the vast majority of our patients. And this is a real headache at the moment. So just keep that in the back of your head is it's not about 
advanced care is all the drama because they were naive patients, but actually it's the switch patients who are the vast majority of the world. And this is a real headache for the somewhere between three and five million. We're not actually sure at the moment, patients who are in South Africa on antiretroviral therapy. So that is a really scary scenario because if the advanced patients are the norm, it means somewhere as many as 80% of the women on antiretroviral therapy and a significant percentage, maybe even the majority of the men are going to end up obese um, on HIV therapy. Now, we've known, interesting enough, that that maybe is not the worst thing in the world. We've known even pre-ARVs that if you were fat, your CD4 countdown went down slower. And we know that your CD4 count goes up faster if, you, um, if you're overweight or BMI is high. Um, and this is the important thing is like the society battles to differentiate between being sexy and being healthy. Um, and we're going to talk about that for just a moment. And, you know, if you really want to be completely cynical about it, you know, if you're looking at CD4 counts, you probably should put a McDonald's in every ARV clinic. Um, but, you know, this is like part of what we need to be thinking about going forward. And this I've presented this last year, I still think it's one of the more provocative things. What I've realized, by the way, if you think people in the HIV field fight and hate each other, you really need to go look at the obesity people. They are like the, the fighting between the epidemiologists when it comes to obesity is something to behold. And I've stepped into this field and I've stepped rapidly out because firstly, I'm outgunned intellectually, but secondly, because they are scary to watch. And this, when I've introduced this study into various conferences without know, unknowingly, I've been torn apart about how stupid I am and how lucky it was in my research. Um, but this was Mark Seidner's study, which demonstrated that the lowest mortality rate was people with a BMI of over 35 in rural case then. Um, so, yeah, if you look at this, you should be supersizing everyone. You should be giving them super, you know, McDonald's vouchers left, right, and center in rural case then to make them live forever. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about survival biases and how these calculations are made, but there have been a lot of studies in the US as well. And as I said, different epidemiologists in different factions and different Ivy League universities battle this out at, um, in the journals um, as we speak. So hold, you know, sort of hold my beer and watch this um, is what I would say as this pans out. And I actually don't know what a normal BMI is anymore having watched these people fight. But the reality of it is, is it's not absolutely clear to me what a good BMI is for our patients anymore. And this review, which is almost a decade old, came out in Nature, which demonstrated, in fact, it's much worse to be very skinny than it is to be whatever high BMI is, uh, is overweight um, and is defined. So maybe we should just be focusing on the skinny patients while they work out what is a bad high BMI. There are things to be thinking about, though, and I think one thing I have realized is just like this, is that, that uh, so much of what we were taught at medical school about what is bad for you and what is a bad BMI and what is unhealthy is actually just nonsense. Like, it's just based on the most terrible science. Um, and more and more of the obese communities like fighting back and saying, sod you, this is a bit like in the old days about being gay. There's nothing wrong with it. And you guys like need to like stop trying to fix us when we're not fixable. And that second patient, like she's like, if you look at my uh, my BMI score, she's on Mark Seidner's like scale. She says, look at that. Like I'm going to live longer than you do. Why are you trying to fix me? You know, you should be trying to feed me. And um, yeah, and technically she might be right. So there's a lot of this like pushback at the moment. The other thing I've been having to deal with, and I've been called out on like multiple like webinars now when I'm attending all these obesity things, because now I have to become an obesity expert, is like you, you know, in the same way you're not allowed to talk about HIV infected people because that's un PC and you'll get stomped on very firmly. Um, you're allowed to talk about obese people, talk about people with obesity in the same way you're allowed to talk about epileptic people or diabetic people, in the same way you can't talk about AIDS dementia, you, you know, you can't, you don't talk about diabetic dementia, like a, there's a whole lot of language stuff that's going down here, so just be aware of those of you like about to go into obesity seminars, you're about to get stomped on. I think the other thing I've also realized since I left the FCP is how much the, the physiology is being changed and how much, like the old, like, oh, it's all calories in, calories out, um, uh, stuff has been dramatically reassessed and um, really interesting stuff actually really challenged me to go back to the textbooks and start immersing myself in the basic science and how weight and energy and all this other stuff um, has been reassessed. So those of you who are interested in this side of thing, there's a whole world waiting for you. I think the other thing that's interesting is like people like us um, um, 
yeah, what's interesting is like only non-obesity people involved in the field think exercise and diet work. When we go to these obesity symposium, like the people who run the obesity clinics, they're like, yeah, we tell people about exercise and diet, but we tell them it's not going to make them lose weight. Like the only people who think that's going to work are like UGPs and physicians. Like nobody else, like nurses think that they, that doesn't work. And when you look at Cochrane reviews and things, that's what happens is it makes you live longer and you're healthier to diet and to exercise, but it doesn't make you lose weight. So that's really interesting because like I've always been led to believe that that lets you lose weight. Um, there's whole lots, as I said, these debates about what are normal values around weights and what is the best. I think what the only consensus I could find about is that BMI is a shocking uh, measure of what is good health. And that depends on how much muscle tissue there is. But, um, interestingly, as you become skinnier, the BMI becomes less and less a good measure, as I said, of good health. And there's like, big debates about which measure and which DEXA scan and which CAT scan. And thing. I think the other thing I was horrified at is this thing. I think many of us who were training for the FCP in my era certainly learned about the Barker's in the hypothesis that if you were starved in utero, you were primed for obesity. But it seems like even if you, an adult or a child, if you were starved in any form, that even if you dieted, even if you diet, you are actually primed for obesity. That if you can, and that's the fascinating thing is we had this um, physiologist actually speak at Croy last year. He said even her view is that HIV is a starvation state such as dieting, being in a concentration camp, primes you for obesity. That once you start eating again, you are prone to become obese. And she says that you know, people who are treated effectively with TLD are probably just going to become obese because they have HIV, which again is terrifying because it means that all our patients are going to likely become, they're going to have very high prevalence of obesity. So this is the amazing thing is that the rest of us are walking around saying people are becoming obese you know, simply because they have poor self-control and they're lazy and they don't get enough exercise. Well, the obesity people are saying, oh, it's all about, you know, genes and modern food and social determinants. It's got very little to do with the individual because you just primed for obesity. We've got to like try and deal with the other stuff. And it is interesting about, think about HIV is a bit like that. Like, you know, we all like, you get HIV, you kind of shrug your shoulders. Everyone else talks about promiscuity and all the rest of it. Those of us in HIV are like, kind of die, whatever. Um, by an obesity, it's also a little bit like that. They're like, whatever, you're going to get obese. It's not really about you. It's about your environment. Um, there's a lot of people who make lots and lots of money. So I was just keep my eye on it. I know that, Jeremy, you said I have a few extra minutes, but I see I've got a little bit more time. Um, but there are, there's a whole industry out there that are making lots and lots of money. And I think we all, what I certainly do, uh, you know, participate in this industry is like, whether it's the diet industry or whether it's the, you know, the kind of gym industry and like Tim Noakes and Dr. Oz and everybody else participating in this industry. There are just a shed load of people who are out there making lots of money. And when it's interesting when somebody says to me, like going to the gym doesn't let you lose weight. And I've told my patients they need to go to the gym. And then they turn around and say, but you should go to the gym to be healthy. That is a very different thing to what I've been advising my patients all these years. So like a bit of cognitive dissonance for me that I need to like get past. I pulled all these like things off the major journals. And I've shown you this before, like, like what is a healthy diet as opposed to what is a diet that makes you lose weight. And I think that like, like the kind of consensus is all these diets make you lose a little bit of weight if you stick to them religiously, but you tend to just rebound. And the healthiest diet is the one that removes processed foods and particularly like sort of processed carbohydrates from your diets. So, you know, again, like this obsession with this diet and that diet, again, I think we all know what we're talking about here um, is difficult. And I, I, I had a whole lot of like slides from various DOH um, recommendations about what a healthy diet is. And it's astonishing at how much pseudoscience is, is just comes from from people who should know better from, from the people advising around diet. So oh, that's wonderful. So what actually, and I, it all sounds terribly bleak. Um, so what does the science actually tell you? It, it's still damn bleak. So I pulled this really wonderful, freely, it's, it's um, freely available. So you don't need to do the, the, there's no paywall on it. This really good NEGM review, a couple of years old now um, from, yeah, from 2017. And they, this just, puts it so beautifully. So they looked at lifestyle interventions. And when I say intensity, intense lifestyle interventions, they are not messing around. This is like lettuce and boiled carrots. 
um, from these three studies. And you can see how few, like if you look at the percentages and the kind of num percentage of patients that actually lost more than 10% of weight, you can see how mediocre these intense interventions were. The drugs, as you can see there, um, so fentamine is a amphetamine compared with topiramate, which is a low dose um, amphetamine. Uh, sorry, a low dose um, anti-epileptic. Now, trexone and bupropion is a um, is an anxiolytic combined with um, yeah. So they are both psych drugs. These drugs all act on the appetite centers. Loreglutide is a um, is a, a diabetic injectable, as also an oral drug. Um, Olistat is the is a drug that interferes with absorption. Um, I can't remember what look caserin that was removed from the market because it had all sorts of side effects. I think it was an absorptive thingy. Um, but you can see there you're getting better impact over 48 weeks, but still not absolutely amazing. The drug that really has electrified everyone in the last year is a drug called semaglutide. Um, it's a GLP-1 agonist, again, centrally acting. Um, and that one really is a blockbuster drug. It's made by Novo. Um, about 50% of patients lose 50%, 50% uh, of patients lose 15% of their body weight um, at 68 weeks. Why they chose 68 weeks, I have no idea. Um, but that drug is becoming, you inject it once a week um, subcutaneously, and that really is become standard of care and is taking over the world. Um, and um, is an interesting thing to reflect upon. Um, it's very, very expensive because it can be. Um, surgery is interesting. It's very expensive. It's quite high risk. Um, it's associated with the best long-term outcomes. But what's interesting is semaglutide 68-week outcomes, and now they're extending it, um, is starting to approach um, surgery. What is interesting is when you stop the drugs, you get rebound. Now, this is important for the next thing which is that, oh, you're just going down to the bottom left there, is that obesity experts, when I start attending all these, um, these webinars, all the obesity experts are saying, you're gonna have to start treating this like diabetes and hypertension, that you're gonna be on these drugs for life, that we must stop, obesity we know is progressive, like diabetes and hypertension, you treat it with lifestyle interventions, and then you put them on drugs, and then you titrate upwards, you don't stop. And it's interesting to see the feedback. I presented the Vitz Public Health people and they were furious with me for suggesting. It's like, oh, you're medicalizing obesity. Oh, it was like, it was, it was really actually quite funny to watch this kind of outpouring of anger and fury. And, you know, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, like uh, it just, it was like this, we should focus on the sugar industry. I was like, yeah, that, you should focus on the sugar industry, but maybe we need some drugs for the patients as well. Um, so, it's, it looks like this is what we're going to be treating obesity as, like diabetes, like hypertension, as a progressive disease. And this paper, which came out a couple of years ago in the NEJM, which looked at type 2 diabetes, that if you manage type 2 diabetes, if you manage the, the blood pressure, if you manage the, the, the sugar, if you manage um, the lipids aggressively, you get outcomes which are very similar to people who don't have the condition. So we may be approaching obesity in the same way, where if we manage the underlying problem and we manage the complications really aggressively in our HIV patients, perhaps that is what we're going to be looking at, is just managing the overall pro issues around it going forward. And I think this is probably the way we're going to need to be thinking about HIV going into the future, is seeing weight gain in the same way we see the rise in sugars starting to, to, to starting to manage that. So I think that we're gonna to have to start counseling our patients that they're probably gonna get fat, you know, that this is just the way life is. And particularly our demographic patients are at risk is that probably tell them to exercise, tell them to um to 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 gain to to to, to watch the diets, but just that's that's a good thing to be doing. Um, I think we need to keep an eye on the ARV options, but um I doubt they're going to be easy answers there. I think that um, the big obesity debates happening, but I, I worry that in the end, we can turn around and say TLD is as good as it gets. You're going to gain weight anyway. I don't think we should be linking the exercise and the good diet to weight loss. I just think it's a hiding, to, looking at the data, as I said, I've had to immerse myself there. It's just a hiding to nowhere. And I think you just make your patients hopeless. And you should just say, that's the stuff you should be doing like I should be doing it anyway. 
I think we should be managing the metabolic complications thoughtfully and thinking about just getting a blood pressure at the local HIV clinic is proving a nightmare for us at the moment, but we really need to be start pushing that stuff. The therapeutics in obesity space is really fun for those of us who are suffering from a little bit of middle age spread. It's becoming more and more of a vital area to be paying attention to. And finally, I think that it's interesting as an activist in the HIV space to start thinking about this body shaming and just sort of like in the same way HIV is that all this shaming language and stuff. But think about how we play a role in all of the stigmas and all this other stuff. And getting called out on webinars and things has been rather interesting, you know, when you're so used to being so smug and politically correct in the HIV field and suddenly getting taken to a part um, is something that's an interesting experience. So, yeah, for all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing your own experiences in this area and hearing how we're going to take this forward in a very exciting area of HIV that I'm certainly um, excited by. Thanks, Jeremy. Over to you guys. I hope I didn't go too far over time. Not at all. Thanks very much. That's really superb, as always. Lots and lots of comments on my cell phone, on the chat and the Q&A about how wonderful that was. So thank you very, very much. Just want to go through a couple of questions. Um, we've got a, a, a few minutes. So um, one is about what sort of terminology to use. I, I see there's a question in the chat about instead of using terms like getting fat, should we use terminology that's like bodies adjusting or resetting? Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I'm not, not fat, I'm big bone. Uh, you know, so, so what... What, what, what are the terms to use? So I think it's, it's people with obesity. That's kind of, a, and yeah, with obesity. And um, that's about it. it. It's actually not that hard. They were, the, the NIH had some really good language suggestions. It's much easier than the LGBTI language. I'll tell you, having just done the transgender guidelines where I really had to dig deep and like get the pronouns and stuff. I mean, I think all of us, you have to understand, I grew up in rural South Africa, um, uh, you know, the, the, that's, uh, you know, the, the, I had to do this again and again and again, reprogram myself. So it's not that hard. So instead of saying obese people, you say people with obesity and that's weight gain. But, um, I think with HIV, we had to do it. The HIV infected, you know, it's just completely unacceptable. And then AIDS dementia, like that was always just dumb as well as just being lazy. Yeah, like I said, we never talk about diabetic dementia or epilepsy dementia, in which case with often there's probably far more cause than with AIDS dementia. Um, so yeah, it's not that hard. Cool, thanks. Sorry, I hope there's not too much background noise. It's hailing on the tin roof behind me. Um, oh, no, it's, then... it's thundering outside here as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then a question from, from Eunice. He says about the, the lead-in dose for cabotegra rupivirine, obviously to ensure there's no toxicity issues. Are there studies, because I know you mentioned there was a recent study showing that there's, it's perhaps not required. Would that be applicable to our population or are we, are we still a way off? So no, actually you can just go straight in actually. Um, it seems to be really safe. Um, yeah, we always were worried that you'd give it in, they'd get Stevens Johnson, you'd have to chop the arm off. Um, so it doesn't seem to be an issue. Vive's very bullish about giving the drug um, to the patients. And the interesting thing is they've used so much of it in the PrEP studies um, that they really have been, it's been very, very safe um, and well tolerated. I think cabotegravir is, rilpivirine, there's a lot of concern about the NRTI background resistance, particularly in our populations. Um, and I think Viv is kind of kicking itself, pairing itself with rilpivirine in the first place with J&J is like kind of wishing it had chosen a better part of the drug. Um, so, and I think Gilead's like sniggering up its sleeve because I think it probably offered it to Vive and Vive and Gilead just have a very tempestuous relationship. And, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think real Purim was kind of the ugly sister you took to the prom. I'm sorry to use a gender insensitive term and that, uh, it's, um, yeah, it, uh, Rilpivirine, I think, is trying desperately to repurpose itself. It's interesting they are using it, though, for, for PrEP. And um, I didn't realize until a few months, like last month, that they actually were, were trying to use it there. Um, let's see how it pans out. It's, it, the trial so far have actually been pretty good. And j, j has been quite aggressive and quite good about actually taking it into trials here in South Africa. Both drugs have been tested fairly extensively in South Africa. So... You know, that is something that's got going, got going for it for both drugs. I'm quite impressed with the safety profiles we've got for them. Um, and then there's some condolence in the chat about your NIH grant, um, but um, 
saying you're in good company. <laughs> and then a, a question also about them asking um, whether you think the long actings will be good for adolescents, given that their outcomes are generally compared to adults. Should we be prioritizing them or shying away? So um, I think that this is the hard thing is like the people who most need long actings are the worst ones for them. So, you know, if you miss the problem with real privilege in Cabotegavir is that Cabotegavir has got this terrible, terrible long tail. You know, what you want is tails that are exactly the same. And Rilpurin's tail is much shorter than Cabotegavir. Cabotegavir, there have been studies which shown it sticks around for like a year in some patients. So those patients are going to end up with integrase inhibitor resistance, which is a disaster in, you know, a, in a country that relies on TLD. Because those are the patients who are probably going to fail TLD if anyone's going to fail TLD. So, you know, adolescents are a living nightmare when it comes to, to adherence. So they're the ones who, who have the, the highest rates of routine, highest rates of, of non-adherence to the drugs. So, you know, those are the ones who you don't want to give those drugs to, and they're the, paradoxically the ones who most need it. The patients who are most likely to get these drugs are the ones who've never had a detectable viral load since time began. We're going to get them, and they're the ones who least need them. So this is the operational headache for this, um, which is, like I said, it's a headache. Adolescents are really a priority population for, for everything, you know, in terms of this. In some of, the, in some of the adolescent clinics, the viral suppression rates are as low as 20, 30%. So anything we can do for adolescents, we should be doing. Unfortunately, the, I don't think this class of drugs are going to solve the problems unless there's something that goes with them, something along the lines of, you know, some major incentive or, you know, uh, home-based care intervention or my personal friend nurse type intervention that goes with it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and just two, uh, two uh, quick questions. One is, um, Nasisa from the PEED side says, do we see any signal of weight gain in children at all, it's a, or even adolescents? Or is it just that they're much harder to gain weight in general at that age? I think so with, with people... integrated inhibitors. I, I haven't heard anything from the adolescent people yet, but they perhaps should, um, maybe should ask first. Okay. Um, and then a, a question about the viral decay being nice and quick with the new agents. Do you think that would predispose you to more iris risk? So that's always been the concern. I must tell you then in advance, we saw almost no, we saw, I think we had five or six cases of iris and they were like, just the usual suspects like low C4 counts and they came with lots of TB. But in all the cohorts, um, and you guys have got lots of actual, probably far more experience, um, you know, the common garden patients, we haven't seen really this, this huge iris risk um, that people talk about. Like a lot of the stuff that was described with the integrase inhibitors and the, the preliminary studies haven't really been seen. The insomnia, the psychiatric manifestations, you know, it's there, but it's really not a major problem. And the same with iris, we really haven't seen it. With the insomnia stuff, you know, the patients slept more than we did um, when we did the actual studies. They, it was phenomenal, actually. They, they slept eight hours in every single arm at start of study, at every single time point we measured. We did insomnia scores like you would not believe. We had the whole um, sleep study unit at VIT6. And when we presented the results, Alison Bentley turned to me and said, I thought you said this was going to be interesting. I thought it was like, it was really like, we, we threw the book at them. We did iris scores. I had Graham Manchies on, on like fast dial because we thought it would be interesting. And like, really, it was, in fact, if that wasn't for the weight gain on advance, it would have been the most boring study on the planet. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then final questions come through is about, you know, about the drug pipeline. So, you know, if, if we do break down Tegrava in any meaningful sense in the, in the country, um, do you think these other agents that you mentioned, you know, is, is Latraviz and, and others, will, will they kind of step in? Do you think we've got a reasonable pipeline beyond integrase inhibitors? You guys need to hurry up and break <laughs> the Tegrava. Honestly, like, it's, it's quite remarkable. We were the first country in the world to break Alluvia, and we did it much faster than this. At the rate we're going, we're going to have yeah, we're going to break Dolutegavir in 20 years time at this rate. You guys need to do something <laughs> and because it's, it's, you know, we've had it for two years and like 5 million people. Um, it's anyway, the, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that we will have agents at the rate we're going. So we're not seeing 
us breaking it in any meaningful way in second and third line. You know, we've got one or two patients who seem to be easing into that rate. You, Jeremy, are the one finding them. But um, yeah, I, I think it's Latrovir, Lenacapavir. There are a couple of other agents that are available. But even in, in rich countries where they've got endless patients who've been on every known drug, they're battling to enroll for patients with who are highly... Um, you know, highly exposed. So I'm, I'm really not worried about the fact that around the pipeline, I'm much more worried about, you know, other things like finding the, the fact that they're testing these drugs again in gay white men in like rich countries, and then they come to us and test in our populations. And suddenly it makes livers, livers exploding people with hepatitis B or, you know, women who get pregnant and all the rest of it. So that's the stuff or some weird side effect that only you guys pick up. Um, the weight gain signal, you know, the neural tube defect stuff that went around, um, the, the lactic acidosis, the lipoatrophy, all that stuff is going to be picked up by you, not by, not, not in North America. Thanks. That's a good optimistic note to, to leave it on. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and most importantly, it's, it's enormously, enormously valued in these, with everyone's feeling so much time pressure. But thank you so much. Hugely appreciate it. Take care, it. everybody. Look after yourselves. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Sure.